Keep me within your love And my heart will sing your praise again Your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Your faithfulness I'm still in your hands This is my confidence You never fail Your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Your faithfulness Still in your hands, this is my confidence. You never failed me Welcome to the gathering of the Church of the Apostles. We are so thankful you are here. All are welcome. I'm going to open us with a prayer and a reading. Let me first say this. Let me first say this. We are so thankful you are here. For you all, every one of you have had a choice today. Maybe go do something else. Maybe just give in to another inclination. And you chose to be here. That God put it on your heart. We want to thank you for that. You are welcome here, always, always. Today, JP is going to be giving us a message from the Gospel of Luke. He's going to be in Chapter 5, and he's going to lean into discipleship. So I would pray that we would tune our ears to JP's message. He usually delivers oh so well. We're thankful for that. I'm going to open up here with a prayer, um, and I'm going to be in the Gospel of Matthew. Please hear my words. When the Son of Man comes... When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, and then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will, be, he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. And then the king will say to those on the right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. And then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, 
When do we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you a drink? And when, when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when do we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Heavenly Father, I thank you for bringing us all here together this morning. I pray to the Father who elects us, to the Son who purchased us, to the Spirit who convicts us. Please hear our prayer. Let our ears be opened this morning. May our hearts be to the rhythm of your drum. And that we would, may we never forget that you are God and we are not. Amen. Please stand with us as we worship this morning. My one comfort, both in life and death, is that I am not mine. I was born with blood. Confess I belong to you alone By the Father's good decree Jesus, you've delivered me By your Spirit set me free To follow you Life and death is that I am not mine. I was born with blood and I confess I belong to you alone. By the Father's good decree, Jesus, you deliver me. By your Spirit set me free to follow you. Jesus, you have taken hold of me. And in your grip of grace I'm finally free. Jesus, you have taken hold of me. And in your grip of grace, I'm finally free. By the Father's good decree, Jesus, you delivered me by your spirit set me free to follow you Let us adore. 
question many of his words who can teach the one who knows all things who can fathom all his wondrous deeds behold our God seated on his throne come let us sinless man God eternal humble to the grave Jesus Savior risen now to reign Behold our God seated on the stone come let us adore Good morning, church. My name is Josh Falk. I'm an elder here uh, at Church of the Apostles, and I'll be reading this morning from Luke chapter 5, verses 27 through 32. That's on page 1075 in the Pew Bibles in front of you. And while you're turning there, as we say every week, if you need a Bible, if you know anyone who needs a Bible, please take this with you. We'd, be, we'd love to buy more, uh, so please take it with you and. and uh, uh, and enjoy it. Uh, this is Luke 5, chapters or verses 27 through 32. After this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me. And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his house, and there were a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at table with them. And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. This is the word of the Lord. Hey, 
you would pray with me, God, we thank you for this opportunity to be gathered here in your name. We thank you that you have given us your word, that you have preserved it, that you have kept it for us, that we can know you, uh, that we can know what you're like and the ways that you've called us to follow you and what that looks like. And so we pray this morning that as we spend time in your word, that you would be the one who leads and guides and teaches us. Uh, We confess each week as we open your word that we cannot do any of this without you. And so we ask that you would be the one that leads and guides us in this time, that you would take the eternal truth of your word and apply it to our hearts and our minds, that we would see you more fully uh, as we think about what it looks like to follow you and and simple, repeatable habits of, of making much of you in our life, that you would show us and lead us and guide us in exactly what this looks like. And so we thank you for this opportunity to be gathered in your name. It's in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Uh, I want you to think for just a second, uh, I guess maybe a quiz of sorts, uh, and think about this for just a second. Uh, In the Gospels, when I say the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the first four books of the New Testament which tell the life of Jesus, uh, as you read through it, Jesus refers to himself quite often as the Son of Man, and it's a phrase that goes back to the Old Testament, and it's loaded with meaning, and he's talking about that he is come and he's been born of a woman, that he's fully God but also fully human. But it also has messianic overtones, and what he's doing when he says that is he's pointing back to the Old Testament, and so that's the, his kind of chosen language for himself. And he says this quite a lot in the Gospels, and he says the Son of Man, and then he'll say, referring to himself. Uh, but three times, three different phrases Jesus uses where he says, the Son of Man came, and then he says something along the way. And there's three different things that he says in the Gospels. And I want you just to think for a second. Does anything come to mind? You don't have to answer out loud or anything, but I just want you to think about it for a second that he says when he says that. Son of Man came, and then what he says. I'm going to tell you all three of them, but I just want you to think. Do you know what they are? Or do they come to mind? Or does something come to mind when you hear that phrase? And so the first one... Uh, Luke chapter 19, uh, he's just talked to Zacchaeus and he's told him to come down from his tree and he's going to go to Zacchaeus' house and uh, Zacchaeus is a tax collector and he's a mess and all sorts of things, but he climbs a tree to see Jesus and he says, come down and I'm coming to your house today. And then he says this in Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, he says, um, uh, the son of man came to seek and save the lost. And so that's the first phrase he uses. The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Uh, But then the second one's in Matthew chapter 20. Uh, James and John's mother comes to Jesus. James and John are two of Jesus' disciples of the 12, kind of his inner circle. And she says to him, "Uh, can my two sons sit at your right hand in your kingdom? Can they be like your right hand man? Can they be right there with you and all this stuff? And this causes issues with the disciples and they start grumbling and complaining and they're getting upset. And in that context, Jesus then says, the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so there's the first two, right? Son of man came to seek and save the lost. He came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. But then the third one's in Matthew chapter 11. And I'm just curious, the first two probably make sense. You go, yeah, 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 I think I've heard that before. Seek and save the lost, uh, give his life as a ransom for many. But do you know what the third one is? The third time he says that, he says, the son of man came eating and drinking. And they said, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. And so I'm just curious, as you think about that, is that where your mind went with the third one, right? Seek and save the lost, ransom for many, but then the third one's eating and drinking. That's what he says. And in a lot of ways, the first two really go to the very purpose of what Jesus came to do, to to meet us in our need and to save us and to to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And that's the very heart of everything we believe. That's the heart of the good news of who God is and what he's done for us in Jesus, But I think the third part there, when he says eating and drinking, really goes to kind of Jesus' methodology and the way he's operating and the way he's calling people and the way he's serving people and the way that he's inviting them in. And you see this throughout the Gospels quite a lot, that Jesus is eating and drinking and spending time with people and sharing meals and going to where they are. And so as we continue in this short series we're doing at the beginning of the year, I've been telling you the last couple of weeks, we've been just saying walking with Jesus daily. This is week three. And what we've been talking about is easily repeatable habits that we can begin to take up and follow Jesus in our life. 
And there are ways in which we're, we're con- starting to walk kind of in his ways or, or to use the language you, we used the first week in Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3 talks about putting to death that which is earthly in you, putting on this new self. Colossians 3.10 says, put on the new self which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of the creator. And so when we talk about simple, repeatable habits, we want to be living up into who we are in Jesus and following him in every area of our life and beginning to put repeatable habits that help us to do that. And so last week, if you were with us, the first habit we talked about is blessing others. And we talked about in word and deed or gifts, but looking throughout your week to have an eye towards blessing other people. And I challenged you last week to bless three people this last week. Whether that's word, deed, action, whatever that looks like. It'd be words of affirmation or just speaking kindly to people or telling them what they mean to you or serving them in some way. Because we talked about last week, we're created in Jesus and recreated in Jesus to not be about ourselves, but to love others. And so this week, we're going to talk about this idea of eating meals together, inviting people into your life. And we're going to look at this passage together in Luke chapter 5, in which Jesus is doing just this. And it gives us this snapshot of kind of the way that Jesus makes disciples and the way he operates and the way he loves people. And the truth is, it's a simple, repeatable habit that we too can begin to follow him in our life. And so today, that's what we're going to talk about. This idea of really of hospitality, uh, of gathering around a table, of why that's important and what that looks like. And so I'm going to tell you four simple things here that are really, really important in this passage. It's a short passage. It's only six verses, but four really important things. And then we'll kind of tie them together at the end. I'm going to encourage you of ways in which eating meals with other people and inviting them into your life can really help these four things that Jesus is telling us to do or showing us. So let's start here in Luke chapter five, right at the beginning. And the first thing, look at the first two verses. It says, after this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi and was sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. And just so we're clear, just so Uh, This doesn't throw you at all, but Levi is Matthew, and Matthew is Levi. They're the same person, right? Just so we're clear, if you didn't know that, don't want that to throw you at all. Uh, We often refer to this as the call of Matthew, Uh, his Jewish name, Levi. He's called Matthew, just so you're clear on who he is. But that's who we're talking about. He was a tax collector, and Jesus comes along the way, and he says to him, come follow me. And it says, he got up, and Matthew did. He follows him, and he left everything. And what we know of a tax collector is it was a lucrative deal to be a tax collector. He made a lot of money doing this. Uh, Matthew was doing that. He's making a lot of money. So him getting up and leaving his job in the middle of it and coming to follow Jesus is a pretty big deal. Uh, He's giving up quite a bit. But here's the thing that I want us to think of, the first thing here that Jesus is pointing us to. And it's simply this, that discipleship happens in all of life. And I say that, it's an important point. It's not unique to this episode and this passage. In fact, it's all the way through the Gospels and what Jesus does. But this is what he does. He extends an invitation to come follow him, to come spend time with him. Uh, Oftentimes that's around a table, which we're going to see in just a minute. But he does this over and over and he calls people to come follow him. And he doesn't come and invite them to a classroom or to a certain setting or, or a lot of the ways that we often think of discipleship when we say that within the church, right? And when I say discipleship, I just mean growing in our relationship with the Lord, growing in obedience to Jesus in every area of our life. I use that phrase quite a lot here. But we're, we're seeking to know who he is and grow in that. But what you saw in the way that Jesus does it is not often the way we think of it. Kind of our modern invention in a very individualistic society is meet me at this place in this setting for this time and you'll be served in this way for an hour or whatever it may be. But what Jesus did is he said, come follow me. And he invited people into his life, into the things that he was doing and where he was going and what it was looking like. And if you start to think about it, uh, it makes a lot of sense in what Jesus is doing. Uh, we talked about, if you go back to the end of last year, we, we spent two years walking chronologically through the Gospels, and we got to the very end, what we call the Great Commission, and Jesus says, go make disciples of all nations. If you were here with us that week, I talked about discipleship with this important distinction. I want to make sure this is fresh in your mind when we talk about what Jesus is doing here. That discipleship is not just believers with other believers helping them grow, 
but it's people that don't yet know Jesus being invited in and discipling, being discipled from unbelief to belief and then from belief to maturity. And that whole process is what the Bible talks about as discipleship. And that's what Jesus calls us to. And that's what we see him doing. He's inviting people to come follow him at different times and in different places. And he's meeting them where they are. And a lot of times they don't know who he is or they're not exactly sure. or They're not to that place yet. But that discipleship begins in that very first part of it. And he invites them into the everyday things of his life. And I want you to think about why that's so important for discipleship. It's, it's not that hard if we get together... Uh, maybe we come here on a Sunday morning or we gather in a classroom or we read the Bible together, which is great. We should. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Don't, don't hear any negative connotation with that. But it's easy in those settings to feel like everything's pretty good, right? Everybody kind of smiles and, oh, it's good. And how's your week? Oh, it's fine. I'm good. And, and everything, right? But then you leave and you go along your life and the real opportunities for discipleship are usually in the week as you go, right? I don't know about you, but the times I get tired and frustrated, and I'm struggling, and I'm short with people, is usually during the week, right? It's in traffic, or it's at work, or it's when this thing doesn't go well, and all of a sudden, that's really where my heart gets revealed. It's easy to put on a good face here. It's easy to be like, oh, it's all good. I'm doing great. I'm super spiritual. And then we walk out of here, and somebody cuts you off, and suddenly I'm not so super spiritual anymore, Right? And so Jesus invites us into every area of our life, helping us to walk with him. And that's the way he made disciples. And that's the way his, if you read through the gospels, that's what's happening. Most of what Jesus is saying is as they're walking along on the way to the next thing. And so much of it is integrated into our life. And that's exactly what you see here. He invites Matthew to come follow me. I was thinking about maybe an analogy of this. I I usually go to Sports analogies. I grew up playing sports. That was my thing. I I loved basketball more than anything else. Played everything growing up, but basketball was my favorite. And so sometimes it's almost like practicing in isolation is kind of the way we do discipleship. And I'll give you an example. I used to play basketball all the time. Every day of, I shouldn't say every day. Most days of my life, I shot baskets. If I didn't have something to do or I was bored as a kid, I went out in the driveway and I shot baskets. Every, almost every day for an hour or two hours or three hours, or I'd play one-on-one with my brother all the time because I love basketball. But I'd go out there and I would shoot baskets and I'd kind of leisurely shoot, right? And you'd shoot and then you'd jog over and you'd pick up the ball and you'd go back and just do it again, just over and over and over. And it wasn't until I was maybe in high school that I realized as much as I practiced shooting, and it helped, and I got better at shooting, and that was helpful, but it wasn't really what it was like shooting in a game. Does that make sense? You don't play a game where you jog over and pick the ball up and take your time and shoot it. That's not what happens in a game, right? When you play a game in basketball, you have to play defense and you have to run up and down the court and you have to find your man and you have to know what you're doing and you race around and then you try to get open and then finally the ball comes to you and you have a split second to shoot it. And really, even if you're really good, right? Like when I got to high school, I was pretty good at basketball and my coach was trying to get shots for me. Even as someone who's a pretty good player, I might shoot it 15 times in a game, maybe. And so the way basketball goes is you may run up and down the court for five minutes and never shoot the ball. And then all of a sudden I get this one chance. And it dawned on me, I wasn't practicing that way. I wasn't practicing with the intensity with which a game demanded. And I think what often happens in our discipleship is we do the same thing, right? We read our Bible in isolation by ourselves when everything's okay, right? We, we don't have, we're not really preparing for what the game's like in the sense of the things that are coming at us in our life. But what Jesus does and what he calls his disciples into is the messiness of life. He says, come follow me in everything. And so we're called as disciples of Jesus to begin to live that way, to invite people into our life, to invite them into the messy parts, not just when everything looks great. And so that's the first thing that I want you to see here. Discipleship happens in all of life as Jesus calls Matthew to come and follow him. But then the second thing I want you to see, look at verse 29. The very next thing it tells us. So he gets up, leaves everything, follows him. Verse 29, Levi, or Matthew, made a great feast in his house. 
And there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at the table with him. And so the second thing that I want you to see as we think about discipleship in all of life, but that growth really happens in the context of deeper relationships. We say that here a lot. I don't know if you've, you've heard this or it's written on the wall. We talk about this, but we say deeper with fewer. That Jesus had the crowds and then he had the 12 and then he had the three and he had deeper relationships with those smaller groups of people because growth happens in deeper relationships. As you're known and what you're dealing with and people can speak the truth to you in your life and what that looks like. And so here what you see happen is Jesus says, come follow me. And then he goes to Matthew's house and Matthew throws this big party and it's all his friends there. And I think part of what's happening here is Matthew wants to invite his friends to come and meet Jesus and see what he's like and get to know him. But then you see Jesus here reclining at the table with Matthew and all his friends and he's spending time with them. In fact, it says here that there was a lot of tax collectors there, a large company of tax collectors and others were reclining at the table with him. In Matthew's account of this, in Matthew's gospel in, verse, uh, in chapter 9, he says that it was tax collectors and sinners. And it's basically kind of like the shady group of people that Matthew hung out with that were far from God, that weren't following the laws of the day, the religious laws of the day. And that's who Jesus is with. And who he's spending time with. And he's investing in them. And he's meeting them where they are. And as, as I was reading this this week, I kept thinking about uh, a phrase a friend of mine in seminary used to say. A guy that I was friends with that was a big evangelist, very relational guy. But he would say this all the time. He would say, you know, we have to earn the right to be heard. And he'd say that all the time. He said, that's where the most fruit's going to be. We have to earn the right to be heard. And what he was saying is, uh, maybe another way to say it, maybe you've heard this phrase before. Uh, I, think, I think I'm right in saying this. I think it's uh, attributed uh, to Teddy Roosevelt, actually. But he says, people don't care what you know until they know that you care. Have you ever heard that before? That's the same thing my friend was saying. You have to earn the right to be heard. You have to actually establish relationships with people or they don't care. <laughs> they don't want to hear what you're saying, unless they know that you care and you've invited them in. And that's exactly what Jesus does in his ministry. He goes and sits down at this party with all these people and he's reclining at the table with all the kind of seedy elements of society. And by the way, tax collectors were the most hated, absolutely the most hated at the time. Uh, if you were with us the last couple of years, we talked about this a lot. But at this time where Jesus is moving and operating, it's controlled by the Roman Empire. And they had the heavy hand of oppression over these people in a foreign land. And they taxed them for everything. They taxed them to the tune of 80 to 90%. That's crazy to think about to me. I get frustrated when I have to pay taxes and it's 20 something percent. 80 to 90%. And so on top of that, they would tax you 80 to 90%. But oftentimes you go and let's say your tax bill is 80%. The tax collector would say you owe 85%. And then they'd put 5% in their pocket and so everyone hated tax collectors. And this is who Jesus is with and who he's spending time with and who he's getting to know and who he's uh, inviting into his life. And so he goes and he spends time with them and he begins to do that. But in order to really have those relationships, we're for seeking discipleship all the way from unbelief to belief as Jesus is and then from belief to maturity, you have to give your time in those places. You have to earn the right to be heard. Uh, maybe you've heard this before. We use this phrase around here sometimes when we talk about discipleship. The idea of invitation and challenge. And what I mean by that is discipleship happens when we have high invitation or friendship or we're spending time together to where we know each other and then challenge that we can challenge one another with the truth. You know what I'm talking about? Maybe you have people like that in your life. I'm, I'm very blessed that there's a lot of people like that in my life. Our elders are people like that in my life. They can say whatever to me because I know that they care for me and that they love me and they can speak the truth to me. Uh, probably more so than just about anyone in my life is my brother, Jeremiah. Jeremiah is my younger brother who is a pastor in Houston and he is a godly, gracious, wise man. And I've known him my whole life. I've known him, I remember when he was born, <laughs> right? I was there. And I trust him within, he can say anything to me. And the reason that he can say anything to me is because I know he loves me. He's proved it for 40 years now. 
that he really truly loves me so he can say whatever. And that's the truth of, of discipleship and what it looks like is that we have to have relationships like that that we can speak the truth to each other. And so the second thing here, growth happens in those, the context of those duper relationships. The first thing, discipleship happens in all of life. But then the third thing that I want you to see is what happens next. Verse 30. And the Pharisees and scribes and their scribes grumbled at all the disciples, saying, Why do you eat with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And so there's a cultural thing happening here that's not real foreign to us. But it was more pronounced in Jesus' day than it is in ours. And it's this. As Jesus sits down to eat with these people, right, the tax collectors and the sinners, and he's in Matthew's house, that that was very clearly a sign of friendship in this time. If you shared a meal with someone, what you were saying is they're my friend. We're, we're in this together. We're, we're, I'm extending friendship to you, right? And so when Jesus sits down here and begins to spend time with all these tax collectors and sinners at Matthew's house, the religious leaders begin to grumble. And they go, what is he doing? Why is he counting those people as his friends? Why is he spending time with those? Doesn't he know who they are? That kind of thing, right? And they're looking down at Jesus. And what Jesus models for us, and this is really important for us to see when we start to thinking about who we invite in and who we spend time with and who we open our house to, And the answer is simply this, that Jesus is love and who he is compels us to love all people. The lines that the religious leaders are drawing, Jesus doesn't have. In fact, where I started at the beginning, when he talks about the son of man came eating and drinking. And they said, look at him, a a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And Jesus is saying that about himself. And he's not apologizing for that. In fact, the next thing he says, yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. What Jesus is saying is, where else would you find me? That's what he says here. That's why I came. I came to seek and save the lost. I came not to be served, but to serve and to give my life a ransom for many. Or when they say that to him here, what does he say? He says, I came for those that are sick, not that those who are well. That's what the doctor comes for when you're sick. And so what he's saying and what he's calling us to And what he's showing us, the heart of Jesus, and it should be the heart of us as we are seeking to be his followers, is that we are called to go to all people. That we're not to draw those lines. That we're to invite people in and to love them well, to care for them. And so you start to think about who that is and, and what that looks like and why that's the case. And everything Jesus is saying is that we desperately need him. That sin has separated us from God. And as followers of Jesus that have come to a saving faith in him, you know that to be true. You know that that is who Jesus is. That he's not just our example, he's our savior. And he's come to do for us what we could never do for ourselves. And we've been separated from God because of sin. But Jesus has come and he invites us in and then he sends us out. So we ended this way just a few weeks ago when we finished the gospels. Right, John 20, 21. As the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you. Or Matthew 28, go make disciples of all nations. And we looked at Acts chapter 1. Go to Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And what Jesus says is you go to all people and you love them in the way that I have loved you. And so the imperative here as followers of Jesus is that we are sent people. And we're sent to all people. We don't get to pick and choose. We don't get to draw those lines. We're called to go. And so you start to go, well, who are those people? Who do I invite in? Who do I open my doors to? Who do I invite to sit down at my table? And the answer is the people that God's put right in front of you. It's the people you live next door to. It's the people you work with. It's the the guy at work that might be a little rough around the edges. And you go, I should invite him over. Or I should go to lunch with him at work one day and hear his story and ask good questions and listen to him. Or it might be somebody in your family, a cousin or a friend or somebody that you go, man, I really need to check up on them. I'll tell you this. Maybe you go, well, that seems hard. I'm not sure what that looks like. and I'm not sure who that person is. Ask God to show you and he'll show you. I really believe that. 
We say that all the time, that God places people of peace in your life. People that are searching and they're asking questions and they're right there. And you go, I'm not sure who they are. People tell me that all the time. You go, you said people of peace. And I understand that idea, but I'm not sure who they are. And I go, well, have you prayed about who they are? If you start praying that, right, you go to your kid's soccer game. And before you get out of your car and you go, God, who do you want me to talk to today? Guess what's going to happen? There's suddenly going to be people all around you. You'll be overwhelmed with how many people when you start to tune your eyes and you start to walk in the spirit and you start to ask God, he'll show you. And so we are sent to all people. We don't draw the lines where the religious leaders are trying to draw the lines, right? So the third thing, the gospel compels us to go to all people. The fourth thing here, look at that again, just the end of what Jesus says, right? So the the religious leaders are grumbling and complaining and why do you eat with them? Jesus answered him, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And I want you to notice Jesus' answer here. And I think in some ways, uh, it's almost like he's speaking in code a little bit. It's so obvious, but it's not if your pride is getting in the way. It's really obvious If you take the whole of what scripture says and everything that God says throughout the Bible, it's really clear what he's saying here, but where you miss it, I feel like the decoder ring here is here. You know what a decoder ring is? They used to have those codes in like cereal boxes and you'd pull out the little thing. I'm I'm old enough to remember that. They did have that when I was still a kid and you'd have to do the little code and figure it out. The decoder ring here to understand what Jesus says is humility. That's that's how you hear what he's saying here. But what Jesus is saying here when he says, I came for those who are in need, for the sick. Or I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Who's he talking about? All of us. Every one of us. We all need his grace. I think the religious leaders hear that and they go, and they're grumbling. What's he saying? He didn't come to call us because we're righteous. Because they're self-righteous. And they're so busy looking down at everyone else, they can't hear it and they can't see it. But here's the thing that I want you to see. I don't want you to miss this. Jesus says we all need him, right? Think about this. Luke chapter 19, rich young ruler comes up to Jesus and he says, good teacher, what must I do to be saved? Right? You know that passage? What does Jesus say? He says, why do you call me good? No one's good, but God alone. Right? So he kind of cuts that off right at the beginning. And what he's saying is like, you never can do enough to do it. Because he says, keep all the laws perfectly. And the guy goes, yeah, I've done that. He's like, "Eh, no, you haven't. (laughs) That's really what he says. (laughs) This is the living Bible. What he says is go sell all your stuff and give it to the poor. And he goes away sad because he knows that he has this idol in his heart that he's holding on to. But what Jesus is saying there is that we all desperately need him, which the Bible says that over and over. You get to Romans chapter three. No one will be justified before God based on their works. None of us. No one will be able to stand before God and go, look at my perfect, sinless life. You should now welcome me into your presence because I'm perfect. None of us can do that. And so when he says, I came to call the sick, and when I came to call those that are in need, he's talking about us. And so here's the part that I want you to see that's so very important. The gospel not only compels us to go to all people, but it also shows us that we all desperately need it. And so please hear this. When we start to think about inviting people into our life to spend time with them, around the table, around meals, it can't be that I'm inviting these people in and they're my project because I've got it all together and they need me to fix them. It cannot be that. And so what is it then? We invite people into our life because of how much we know that we desperately need Jesus. And we know that they desperately need Jesus. And I want them to see the glory of who God is and what he's done for us in Jesus. And it's not come and look at me and how I've got it all together. It's come sit next to me and let us gaze at the glory of our creator who loves us so much that he would do for us what we could never do for ourselves. And that's the only way that'll ever work. With great humility that you go. And it's not, I've got it all figured out. It's come walk with me. Right? As Jesus says, come follow me as I follow Christ. That I'm going to point you to Jesus. 
that I'm going to even show you as you step into my life, you'll find out real quickly if we start to walk together that I don't have it all together. That I need to be continually repenting and that I need to be growing and I need to be pointing you to Jesus, but I need you to point me to Jesus. And that's the only way that will ever work. That you understand how much you need him and then you're compelled to go and go, oh, I want them to see this. I want them to see the glory of who God is and what he's done for us in Christ. And so I want you to take those four things and think about that for a second. Discipleship that happens in all of life. Growth happens in deeper relationships. We're compelled to go to all people because we know how desperately we need Jesus. And a simple, repeatable habit that can begin to form in our lives is to invite people in to share a meal with you. That's what Jesus is doing all the time. And so last week I said, can you bless three people this week? Word, deed, action, gifts, whatever that might look like. What I'm going to say to you this week is, could you eat three meals this week with someone that's outside your immediate family? Some of you go, three? I don't know what I'm doing for dinner later. Like, what are you talking about? I'm too busy. Like, how is that going to work? Some of you have a job or your situation or where you are. You already eat three meals a week with different people. And I realize that's different for everybody. If you're sitting here and you're a mom and you homeschool your kids and you're trying to figure out and you go three meals with other people, that might sound so daunting. But I want you just to think about easy ways that you'd begin to step into that. I'll give you a couple. One, we had Wednesday night dinner here this week. And so we do that once a month. There you go. There's one right there. You show up and you eat with the people around the table and you get to know them better and spend time together. You can invite anyone you want to come to that. Right? Free meal. Invite people to come to that. You don't have to pay anything for it. You can just invite them to come with you. But that's one, maybe. Uh, Maybe part of it is if you're a a part of a DNA group. I have breakfast with a couple guys every week. And that's what our DNA group does on Friday mornings. And we sit and have breakfast together. And that's one of them. Some of it may be if you're at work, spending time each week at work. Of I'm going to make a point to invite somebody to sit down and have a meal with me. Even if it's just over your brown bag lunch that you take, would you eat with me? And start to think of creative ways and what that looks like. Now, some of you might go, I I don't know that I can do three. The truth is that particularly if you're talking about going to eat with someone, it's hard to pay for three meals today, right? Like it's so expensive everywhere you go. That's really hard. So maybe it's inviting people into your house. Maybe it's asking God to show you. And maybe it's not three this week. Maybe it's one. Maybe you're not doing that at all. But the other challenge or the second part of that as you think about three meals in a week is could you have one meal a week with someone that doesn't yet know Jesus? Neighbor, coworker, friend, whoever that is. Invite them in. Invite them to your house. Invite them to share a meal with you. Ask good questions. Listen. Love them well by serving them. Look for opportunities to do that. Be creative. One of the things that I'm telling you that we've talked about in our missional communities, if you're not part of a missional community, it's groups that get together throughout the week and we spend time together. One of the things we're seeking to do with our missional communities this year is one time a month you sit down together for a meal and that's an open table that you're free to invite anybody that you want to invite to come to that. And then you begin to do that together and make that a rhythm together. And then you don't feel like all the pressure of, I got to do this. Oh, we can do this together. That's the way God designed us to do it together as we're going in all of life with deeper relationships, doing that together. And so think of what those might start to look like. I'll give you one other idea. And I'll tell you, if you pray and you ask God, he'll give you lots of ideas. I'm convinced uh, many of you are way more creative than I am. You'll come up with way better ideas than I could even suggest. But I'll give you one that's coming up that's a real easy one. Uh, The Super Bowl. Invite people over to watch the Super Bowl. It's actually like a cultural thing. All you got to do is have sandwiches, chips and sandwiches. And everybody's like, this is awesome. Super Bowl and sandwiches. It's an easy way. Look for things that are celebrations, right? Birthday parties, your kids' birthday parties, friends' birthdays, anniversaries. Begin to invite people in. Follow Jesus in the way that he's called us to follow him. This is what he did. 
And it gives you simple, easily repeatable things. And so I just want you to think about this, and I'll, I'll end here. Last week, I said blessing three people each week. I don't know how that went for you. I made a very specific point in my life last week that I was going to do that, and I think I probably had 15 opportunities to do that. I think once you start to think that way, three is easy in a week. I think, I think realistically we could do three in a day or at least that many. Just looking, beginning to talk and speak the truth and love people well and saying it. But then what would it look like if you're blessing three people all the time? Or maybe it's more than that. It's like that ball that gets rolling and it picks up steam. And then you start to invite people into your house. And you start to share meals with them. And then you're reading scripture. Right? We talked about that the first week. And you're reading it together. And you're praying and ask God what it looks like. I'm convinced that if we all started to live that way, we can change the world. The people in this room can change Dawson County by beginning to do that. I really believe that. Like it'll suddenly change the way you operate and the way you think and the way you see people. And what we looked at at the very beginning in Colossians 3, we're now walking in the Spirit. We're participating in the Spirit in everything we do, and God will overwhelm you with what He's capable of. I'm convinced of it. And so I just ask you to pray about those repeatable habits in your life and the ways in which you follow Jesus. And He will meet you in the midst of that. And so would you pray with me? God, we thank you that you love us so much that you've come to us to do what we could never do for ourselves. We thank you that you tell us that you came to seek and save the lost, that you came eating and drinking and sitting down at the table with your creation, with your people and calling them to you. And so help us as we seek to follow you, to operate in the spirit each and every day, to see people in the ways that you see them, to follow you into the mission that you've given us to love others well. And so I pray for each person here that you would show them exactly what that looks like this week, that they would have opportunities. I pray that you would surprise us with the simplicity of just naming your name and pointing people to you. I pray that you would spark in each one here great creativity on ways to love and care for people around them. And we pray that all of it would be for your name's sake and for your glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, this is the time in our service, uh, as we finish the sermon, that we celebrate the Lord's Supper together. And as we do so, we're remembering uh, what Jesus has done for us. Uh, it's not lost on me when I think about that today, that Jesus instituted that time around the table. Right? He was having dinner. Passover with his closest followers and he gets to the end of the meal or whenever it was during the meal that he does this and he says I have eagerly desired to eat this with you and I always am struck with that that there they are eating this meal together this traditional meal that they had all done throughout their life and Jesus is about to totally shift what it points to and, and what it means and they're about to see the fullness of us and it's hours before he's going to lay down his life He's about to die, but he says, I am so eager to tell you about this. And then he says that you would do this in remembrance of me. And so there Jesus is, loving people well, meeting them where they are, eating this meal with them, and he institutes this time and he tells us to do it in remembrance of him. So the scriptures record it this way. It says, when the hour had come, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And he took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so there he is around a meal, proclaiming what he's about to do. And he says, when you gather together, continue to remind each other. Be reminded that Jesus has done for us what we could never do for ourselves. By his broken body and his shed blood, he took on the sin of all those that would put their faith in him. And he offers us forgiveness. And so when we come to the table, we're being reminded of who we are whose we are, 
how we're sent out to love him and to love others. And so you have the next few minutes here. We're going to sing two songs. And during that time, you can come and partake of the elements. There's two stations on each side. There's one in the back. Uh, We have elders on the sides to serve you there. But come as you're ready. And so if you need to deal with God with some things or you need to pray or you need to think about the way he's leading you, you just need to stop and have a moment of thankfulness and gratitude for what it is that Jesus has done. Take your time this morning and then come when you're ready as we sing these songs together. Stand with us as we continue to worship this morning. I surrender all. Oh, I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender. Trust in me. 
God, we do pray uh, that, as we just sang, that we would surrender to you in all things. And so as we go this week, give us opportunities uh, to follow you wherever that may be. And so we pray that you would tune our hearts to be people that are quick to bless others uh, in the ways that you show us. And so give us opportunities to do that. We pray that we would be seeking to love and care for others and meet them at their point of need. I also pray that you give us opportunities to open our homes, to open our lives, uh, to share meals with one another, uh, to grow in deeper relationships as we encourage each other, but also to invite people in that don't yet know you, that are far from you, that are struggling right now, that we could uh, open our doors to love them in the ways that you've loved us. And so give us eyes to see people the ways that you see them. Give us opportunities this very week. Uh, to make much of you and to show people what you are like. And we pray all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Just a few announcements before we dismiss. We started a new membership class this week. Uh, runs for three weeks from the 9 to 10 o'clock hour. We meet downstairs in the classroom down there. If you didn't come today but you would like to or you have questions about what that means or being part of Church of the Apostles, it's not a commitment to join the church. It's just just uh, for you to ask your questions and uh, understand what we're all about and what we're trying to do here. And so we'd love for you to come and be part of that. Again, that'll be the next two weeks during the nine o'clock hour downstairs. Uh, also wanted to remind you, we've been doing this uh, Read Scripture Together plan that we started at the beginning of the year. Uh, there's a simple app that you can download. This is called the Read Scripture app. You'll see uh, different areas outside where you can scan the QR code and look that up. If you look it up uh, on the app on your phone. It's just Read Scripture is the, the name of the app. And so I'd love for you to do that. We're doing the Bible, Read Through the Bible plan together. But then each section, as we go each week, we're also highlighting one particular passage that we're then gathering together 
in the nine o'clock hour on Sunday morning to discuss and just what's God showing you and what does that look like. This coming week, it'll be Exodus chapter 12. That'll be the next one that we're looking at. And so if you're behind on your read scripture or you're just starting or whatever, I would just say continue to read today. Right? Be faithful today with what God's put in front of you. Uh, if you get behind, we've purposely highlighting this one passage so you can come and read that. And so I'd love for you to come next week at nine o'clock. Just so we're clear, so there's no uh, uh, confusion on this. We are having a new member class and we are having read scripture and they happen at the same time. It's not one versus the other. So we're gonna do the read scripture every week this year, all the way through. And so even if that's a handful of people some weeks or a whole bunch of people, whatever that looks like, we'd love for you to come and be part of that. That'll be happening. And so when we have the new member class, we'll just be going at the same time and that's okay. Uh, But just wanted you to know that that'll be each week. And so love for you to come at the nine o'clock hour and do that with us. Also, uh, one other announcement, just wanted to let you know that the ladies are having a coffee and fellowship time at Panera Bread on Friday morning at 9.30 a.m. And so if that fits your schedule and you can make that, ladies, we'd love for you to come and share that time of coffee and fellowship together on Friday at 9.30 a.m. And then one last one, uh, we've been saying this if you weren't aware, if you're here and you're volunteering or you're serving, or if you just get here early, at 10 o'clock in the side room right there before our service, we're just having a short time of prayer as we pray for our service and different needs and things that are happening. And so if you get here early and you want to join us in prayer, you are more than welcome to come and be part of that. That's at 10 o'clock right there on the side room every Sunday morning. And so I think that is it. For announcements today, if you would stand with me for the benediction from Second Peter chapter 3, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here be. Father